Hey, thanks for checking out this sermon. It's designed to help you take your next step with Jesus. And if you haven't been able to make it to one of our campuses and participate in the time of giving, you could do so online through our website or by texting to give so that you can continue to participate in the mission that God has given us. We hope that God speaks to you through this sermon. Cornerstone. Uh, it's great to be with you today. We are continuing our Go Tell It series, and we're going to be talking about joy, uh, which actually seems fitting because we talk more about joy during the Christmas season than perhaps any other time of year, right? I mean, this is the time of year where we put out decorations adorned with this three-letter word. It's where we sing songs of joy coming to the whole earth. Um, it's where we fill our calendar with activities and parties and festivities and all the other E's in order to, uh, that we hope to experience the joy that this Christmas season holds. I mean, think about it. Joy, it's why we spend more money uh, than we planned on our kids' Christmas presents because we just can't wait to see the joy on their faces when they open them Christmas morning. Joy is the reason that my father-in-law decorates his house with thousands and thousands and thousands of lights every, every Christmas season because he can't wait to see the joy on his nine grandkids' faces the moment they turn onto his street. I'm not kidding. His house looks incredible. This is what it looks like currently. Right? Yeah, it's awesome. And, and, the, and the, the better thing is I don't have to take Hudson to Disneyland now because he thinks Papa's house is way cooler. So that worked out well for me. Um, thank you, Ted, for spending a lot of money in electricity so I don't have to spend a lot of money at Disneyland. Um, but think about it. Joy is why we'll watch video after video after video of military kids receiving the Christmas surprise of their lifetime, right? When their parent comes home from deployment. And that moment they first see their mom or their dad and they just explode with tears of joy, right? And, and that's not just them, it's us too. It doesn't matter who you are or what you're doing. You see that and it's like instant waterworks, yeah. If you don't cry when you watch those videos, take your pulse, okay? Because seriously, I was actually gonna show one of those videos today and then this whole week as I'm watching those videos, I just immediately turned to a blubbering mess and so I like, I next the idea. I'm like, I can't have that. But man, it gets me every single time. There's just something about joy. And our story today, it's filled with it. It's an incredible story. Grab a Bible, open your Bible app, turn with me to Luke chapter one. And it's here that we'll actually find a story of two expectant mothers. One's old and one is young. One is six months along in her pregnancy and the other is very newly pregnant. And the incredible thing is that the fact that either one of them is expecting to begin with is totally unexpected. See, neither one of them should have been pregnant under normal circumstances. But the reality is these are anything but normal circumstances. And the first mo mother we meet is Elizabeth. We were briefly introduced to her last weekend uh, when Elizabeth's husband, Zachariah, was visited by the angel Gabriel. And Gabriel told Zechariah that he and his wife Elizabeth would conceive a son. He would be named John. And John would prepare the way for the coming Messiah. But see, Zechariah, man, he doesn't believe what the angel is telling him. Him and his wife are now in their old age. And after decades and decades of barrenness, he's like, man, I need some proof that this is going to happen. I just don't believe it. 
And it's because of this disbelief that the angel tells Zechariah, okay, you want some proof? All right, the proof I'll give you is that from this moment until the, the day your son is born, you'll be made mute. That should be enough proof to let you know that what I tell you is true. And sure enough, from that moment on, Zechariah lost his ability to speak. And sure enough, Elizabeth, after decades of barrenness, who's now in her old age, has become pregnant, and she's six months along. Could you imagine that? Like Zachariah, who's mute, trying to tell Elizabeth what the angel of the Lord told him. Like it's like this, the greatest game of charades ever. Um, <laughs> and then in Luke 1, 25, Elizabeth, she says this, the Lord has done this for me. He has shown his favor, and he has taken away my disgrace. Man, she is just overjoyed. And then the second mother we meet is Mary. And as we learned last weekend, Mary is a teenage Jewish girl who just received the most shocking, overwhelming, life-altering news. The angel Gabriel visited her as well, and he said, hey, Mary, um, you, even though you're a virgin, you will conceive a son, and he will be the long-awaited Messiah. In fact, he, you'll name him Jesus, he will be the very son of God, conceived not through traditional means, but from the Holy Spirit. And in stark contrast to Zechariah, Mary, her response to the angel is one of humble obedience. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And Gabriel, he ends his conversation with Mary by telling her that her cousin, Elizabeth, who Mary would have been fully aware of, was unable to conceive a child that, that Elizabeth is in fact pregnant and in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail, Gabriel says. In other words, nothing is impossible with God. And it's right here that we're gonna pick up the story today, starting in verse 39. Hope you've had a chance to find it now. Here's what Luke writes. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Okay, if you're like me, you read this, and it's really easy to underestimate the type of journey that Mary would have gone on here in order to get to Elizabeth's house. But you see, if we study it more in depth, we'll learn that Nazareth, where Mary lives, um, it, the distance from there to the hill country of Judea, where Elizabeth lives, is about 80 to 100 miles. 80 to 100 miles. And we don't know exactly where because it just tells us the hill country. It doesn't tell us Zechariah and Elizabeth's specific town. 80 to 100 miles. Think about it. This wasn't just like a quick journey to the neighboring village. No, most likely it would have taken four to five days for Mary to complete this journey and she would have done it on foot. Some think that she traveled as a part of a caravan. Others think because she left so quickly that she actually went all alone. Regardless though, this would have been an extremely dangerous trip for anyone to take, let alone a teenage girl. It would be like, Think of it this way. It would be like your eighth grade daughter, who's pregnant, by the way, walking from Livermore to Sacramento. Could you imagine that? Some of you are like terrified right now because you actually have an eighth grade daughter. Sorry. Um, but it kind of puts the whole story in a new perspective, doesn't it? It's obvious that, that this visit to Elizabeth was extremely important to Mary. So that should lead us to ask, Why? Why is that? And see, I actually think it's because Mary alone knows the biggest secret in the world. And I imagine in the moments after the angel leaves and the reality starts to sink in about what just happened, she's starting to be filled with fear and anxiety. Right? Like, She's a, she's a teenage girl. And the one piece of information that the angel Gabriel gave to her that could reassure Mary that what he said to her is in fact true is the, is the fact that her cousin Elizabeth is pregnant and is six months along. And so even though Mary already has it set in her heart to trust and to obey what the angel said, I believe that she sets out on this trip in haste, it hurried, so that she can receive affirmation. Like if you remember, Zechariah, he struck mute because he wanted proof of what the angel said before he was willing to obey. 
He asked for affirmation before obedience. But see, Mary, she's the opposite. And this is an important lesson for us. See, Mary's the healthy example that teaches us that affirmation follows obedience and not the other way around. See, God, he has no problem giving us clarity, especially to the things he's asking us to do. But to be honest, oftentimes that confirmation, that clarity, it comes after we've already taken steps of obedience. See, Mary doesn't say, hey, prove yourself, then I'll trust you. No, she trusts and she obeys and then she seeks confirmation of God's plan. And that's why she hurries to Elizabeth's house. She wants to get some encouragement that she is not going crazy. I mean, she needs to see with her own eyes the baby bump on this old woman. Mary must be thinking, okay, if what Gabriel said about Elizabeth is in fact true, then what he said of me is true as well. And so Mary, she hurries to Zach and Liz's house and here's what happens. Look at verse 41. <clears throat> Luke says, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Man, this is good. There is so much that's going on here. See, first, when Elizabeth greets Mary, Luke says that she's filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and in a loud voice, she exclaims. And that phrase, in a loud voice, she exclaimed, that phrase in Greek, it, it literally means uh, to shout as though using a megaphone. It, it, it's, it's, it's literally implying like a big or a mega voice. But see, you see, Elizabeth, she isn't simply shouting in order to be heard, right? She's not just yelling. No, she is, it's more of a shout of joy, right? It's like, it's like when uh, someone greets you unexpectedly. Maybe someone who you love, who you haven't seen in a long time, and your response is just like a shriek of joy. A couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to take both my boys um, back to St. Louis to visit my family. And uh, it was a last minute trip because someone had gifted me with a flight. And so I decided to just tell my sisters that I was coming and not let my parents know so that we could surprise them. And when we first arrived, my dad was home and so we got to surprise him right away, but my mom uh, had a work appointment. And so it wasn't until later that night that my mom comes strolling into my sister's house and we're hiding around the corner. And well, here's what happened. What are you guys doing? You look suspicious. Stop. Yeah, that, that would be my son Hudson killing the joyful moment by smacking grandma in the face several times. Oh, the joys of two-year-old boys, they're fantastic. Uh, <laughs> and I love that my mom is immediately suspicious. Like, you know she's a mom of six kids when she's like, wait, what's going on here? Um, but immediately when my mom sees us, she lets out this shriek of joy. And I imagine that's what Elizabeth is, is how Elizabeth is greeting Mary here in this moment. But you see, it's a greeting that's, that's not just filled, it's not just joy filled, it's also spirit filled. When Luke says that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, it's actually a phrase that you'll find on several occasions in the Old Testament. And it's referring to uh, when prophets or others were, were, uh, were about to speak out in prophecy under the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what Elizabeth does here. She is filled with the Holy Spirit and she proclaims what Mary has not yet told her. Think about it. Elizabeth, she's filled with the Holy Spirit and she proclaims what's not yet visible to the eye, that Mary is in fact pregnant. Let's put ourselves in Mary's shoes for a moment. I like to imagine that over this several day journey to Elizabeth's house that Mary is just rehearsing over and over and over again what she's gonna say 
right? We do this too when we're like, oh my gosh, how is this gonna go? And she's probably like, okay. So Liz, I've got something to tell you. Promise me you won't freak out, right? You should, you should sit down for this. Okay, so the other day, an angel of the Lord appeared to me and he told me that even though I'm a virgin, I'm gonna miraculously become pregnant with the son of God. No, 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 I can't say it like that. How, I, of course I can't say it like that. Like, she's gonna think I'm insane. I mean, she's gonna think I'm going crazy. She's gonna think I'm lying to her. She's gonna kick me out of her house. Then where will I go? She might not ever talk to me again. What if she tells everyone? What if she tells my parents? Because remember, she's a teenage girl. Teenagers hate being tattled onto their parents. And so you can imagine this anxiety that could be building up in Mary. And she arrives to Elizabeth's house. And how incredible it was that Mary isn't even the one who tells Elizabeth the news. Like it's the Holy Spirit who reveals these things to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth stops Mary's rehearsed speech even before Mary has the chance to begin it. Imagine the sigh of relief that Mary took in that moment. And beyond that, not only does the Holy Spirit tell Elizabeth that Mary's pregnant, but he reveals to her that the baby she is carrying inside is in fact the long-awaited Messiah. Look at, um, look at verse 43. Mary says, but, or Elizabeth says, but why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? The word Lord here in Greek is the word uh, kyrios. And uh, it is the same Greek word that is used to translate the Hebrew word for Yahweh, which means one true God. See, Elizabeth here, she, by saying this word, she is identifying Jesus's divinity. She's saying, yes, Mary, your son, the baby that you bear is in fact the one true God. And then she continues on. And look at verse 44, she says, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. You know, I grew up in the church and I have heard the telling of the Christmas story like nine billion times. And because of this, it, I understand how easy it is to just race over these all too familiar words. But I mean, we need to slow down here because I love the image here that John, he leaps for joy in Elizabeth's womb simply because he's in close proximity to Jesus, who's in Mary's womb. See, what we thought was gonna be a meeting between two mothers has turned out to be a meeting between two sons. And John, from the womb, is doing what he's been destined for. That is to point others to Christ, to proclaim the way of the coming Messiah. John, he leaped for joy. It's beautiful to think about. Let's talk about that word for a minute. Joy. Joy. For some of us, 2018 has been a year that's been filled with joy. Man, with blessing. With good things. For others of us, it's been a year that we aren't going to miss. I mean, for me, it's been a bittersweet mixture of both. On one hand, it's been a year of new life with the birth of my son, Layton, and the birth of my nephew, Johnny. And yet, on the other hand, it's been a year shadowed by death with the unexpected loss of my brother, John. Like, on one hand, it's been a year that has uh, overflown with joy and the laughter. And on the same, on the other hand, it's been a year that has had an abundance of grief and tears. And I know for many of us, this has been a year that has brought about the loss of a job or a loved one or a dream. It's been a year uh, that, that brought about an, uh, a deep depression, an unwanted diagnosis. 
Maybe it's what this year didn't bring that has actually been the most painful thing to endure. There's, there's still a, a broken heart, a, a, a strained relationship, an empty womb. And if we're honest, I think that there are some of us who enter into this Christmas season and we're just trying to hold on and like hope that we make it through to the other side. And that's me. And if that's you too, like I want you to lean in here. Because what John shows us is the very important truth that the presence of Jesus, it brings joy. The presence of Jesus brings joy. And when I say joy, I'm not simply talking about excitement. I mean, yes, joy is closely related to, to gladness and to happiness, but joy is more a state of being than simply an emotion. And this is because joy is a fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter five, the apostle Paul, he gives a list of nine attributes that he calls fruit of the spirit. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He, he says that these are attributes that are produced in the life of a believer through the power of the Holy Spirit who's at work within us. Think about that for a moment. The same Holy Spirit who is at work in this story, empowering Elizabeth, speaking through Elizabeth to Mary. This same Holy Spirit is the one who lives inside of you and is empowering you. And it's this Holy Spirit who works in us and can produce these things in us, these attributes in us, even if our circumstances don't warrant them. Like, have you ever met someone who seem to be having everything going right in their life and yet they're void of joy. Whereas we've all probably met people who we look at their life and it seems like everything is falling apart and yet they're overflowing with this inexplicable joy. And the reason this is, is because joy, it's a fruit of the spirit. It's not a result of our circumstances. Let me say that again. Joy is a fruit of the spirit, not a result of our circumstances. And so for those of us who may be feeling more dread of this holiday season than excitement, like this is good news. This is good news for those who are in the midst of anxiety or loss or heartache or uncertainty. What this means is that we don't just have to grit our face, or grit, grit our teeth and put on a happy face. It means that we don't have to try and just muster up the strength to like be excited and get into the Christmas spirit. No, we can actually experience true joy, like real, genuine joy, even if nothing about our circumstances changes. And that's because joy is not dependent on us having a different story or more guarantees or less suffering. Joy is actually not dependent on us having a different personality or better health or more financial security. Like joy, true joy that is found in Jesus Christ, it transcends and it transforms our tears and our circumstances and our heartaches. Psalm 1611, it actually states, in your presence is fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. I mean, this truth, it's simple, yet it's profound. Regardless of what 2018 has been like for us, regardless of the circumstances that we're presently walking through, we can actually find joy, not just in part, but in full, simply by spending time in God's presence. The presence of Jesus brings joy. Man, if you need an increase of joy this holiday season, simply slow down and spend some time with Jesus. Like maybe you do that through prayer. Maybe you do that through reading the word. Maybe you do that through worship or through listening to the Spotify playlist that our worship leaders put together. 
Maybe you do that for going on walks and enjoying creation or spending quality time with your family. Whatever that may look like for you, like allow the presence of Jesus to just fill you with joy. I mean, it's why we sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Right, what we're saying is joy to you, joy to me, because the Lord has come, because Jesus has come, because he is here, he is present, and his presence, it brings us joy. Let's keep reading. Elizabeth, she finishes her address to Mary with this. Look at verse 45. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. What Elizabeth is saying here is, Mary, man, I, I just wanna tell you that your faith in God, in, in your faith in God in the midst of what he has promised you, even though it seems completely insane and, and, and even impossible, like that faith that you're exhibiting, it's incredible. Like, may God bless you because of it. I mean, I just love the idea that this teenage girl has this older woman who is just speaking encouragement and truth over her at what is probably the most uncertain time Mary has ever experienced in her life. And a cool thing to note here is that... um, the first blessing that Elizabeth gives to Mary, it's written in the second person where she says, blessed are you among women. But this blessing, Elizabeth's second blessing to Mary, it's actually written in the third person. Notice verse 45, she says, blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Blessed is she. See, Elizabeth here is inviting others, she's inviting us to respond like Mary with faith. See, I believe our joy is very closely tied to our faith. The reason that we can find joy in the presence of Jesus, despite the circumstances that we are currently going through, is because of the faith that we have, that God is who he says he is, that he is a good God, he is a faithful God, and he will fulfill the promises he has spoken to us. That is what Mary believed and that is what Elizabeth encouraged her to believe and that is what we have to believe as well. Blessed is she, blessed is he who believes that the Lord would fulfill his promises. And then this beautiful encounter between Elizabeth and Mary, uh, it, it, it concludes with Mary responding to Elizabeth's joyful prophecy by bursting out in her own joyful song. You can actually read through it um, later this week. Read through it slowly. It's verses 46 through 55, and it's what many refer to as Mary's song or, or the Magnificat, where Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord. She says, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And then she continues on to proclaim the truth of who God is and the work that he's doing in this world and the liberation and the salvation that's going to come through the baby that's being birthed inside of her. It's a beautiful song. It's a joy-filled song, which when you think about it, is kind of surprising because Mary's circumstances don't really warrant joy. I mean, yes, Mary is obedient to God and she is exhibiting an extreme amount of faith, but she's also a teenage girl whose world is about to get completely turned upside down. I mean, think about it. At this point, only Elizabeth knows that Mary is pregnant, but soon everyone will know. Like Mary is fully aware that her saying yes to God, that, that, that this pregnancy could very well mean she is shunned by her family. She, she's rejected by her future husband. She's ostracized by her com- community. Like it would leave her reputation in shambles. Mary could very well lose everything. Yet, she's singing the song of joy. 
And I believe it was the joy that Elizabeth expressed, that she exhibited, that allowed Mary to respond with joy as well. Like Elizabeth's joy exponentially grew Mary's joy. And that's because joy, it's contagious. Isn't it like joy? It's, it's contagious. My friend's parents celebrated their 33rd wedding anniversary. And they did so by doing 33 things they had never done before in 33 days. They um, slept in a tent in their backyard. Yeah. They um, went to the park and played on all of the playground structures and got really weird looks from all the parents. They walked around their block backwards. (laughs) They had dinner with some of their neighbors who are seniors and just sat and listened the whole night long as they just shared their life stories. They TP'd their adult daughter's apartment. (laughs) They got caught, which was even better. (laughs) But man, they just exuded joy throughout these whole 33 days. And anyone that was around them, anyone that came in contact with them, they couldn't help but be filled with joy as well. It's because joy is contagious. There are many of us here uh, or who are listening to this online who are experiencing a lot of joy in our lives currently. That, that we're experiencing blessing. Maybe you, like Elizabeth, you're in the midst of God fulfilling a promise to you. Maybe you, like Elizabeth, you're in the midst of this dream that you've had for years finally being realized. And man, you're just, you're just overflowing with this joy. And if that's you, you don't have to feel bad about it. You don't have to try to like hide your joy from those of us who aren't feeling joyful. No, own it, treasure that joy. But what you have to remember is that that joy is not meant to just simply fill you up. Joy is always meant to overflow out of us to those around us. Because joy is contagious. And so those of us who have joy, we actually have this responsibility to go and to tell it, to to bring that joy with us wherever we go, to share it with the people that we come in contact with on a daily basis. And so I'm gonna close with this challenge. My challenge is that each of us would spend some time this week thinking about specific people in our lives, in our spheres of influence, who are in need of joy. Like actually make a list of names. Actually picture specific faces. Who are the people in your life that are in dire need of the joy that you have? Talk about it with your community group this week. And then once you think of those people, here's what you have to do. You have to get creative in thinking about how you can bring that joy to them. Like, come up with a plan of action. We actually have a little over three weeks before Christmas. So maybe you can even put together your own list of things to do. 21 things you're gonna do in the next 21 days that not only fill you with joy, increase your joy this holiday season, but it also intentionally shares that joy with those around you, especially those who need it. Man, and then think of how incredible it will be if we're all intentionally doing this over the next three weeks that we'll arrive at Christmas Eve at our services and we're just fully ready to celebrate all that that holds because we're just bubbling over with this joy, this true joy, this genuine joy that's only found in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, you are a good God. You're a faithful God, one who keeps his promises to us. And God, because of that, we can be filled with joy because of that we can experience the joy that's found in your presence, regardless of the difficult circumstances we might presently be walking through. So God, I pray for anyone who is in need of joy this holiday season. God, I ask that you would draw them into your presence. 
I pray that it's in your presence that they would be filled with your hope and your peace and your comfort and your joy. And God, I pray that that's a joy that we wouldn't just keep to ourselves, but it's one that we would spread to others. That you would intentionally provide some divinely appointed moments for us over the next three weeks where we can encounter people who are in need of joy and we can bring that to them. Lord, not a false excitement, but a true, genuine joy that only comes from your spirit. Lord, show us how to do that. Give us the creativity and the courage to follow through on it. God, my hope and my prayer is that the people of Cornerstone Fellowship would be known throughout the East Bay as being carriers of joy. Man, what an incredible reputation to have. May that be true of us, Lord. We love you, Father, and we pray these things in your son's mighty name. Amen.